So let me tell you a case from my clinical practice. Guy comes in. This is, this is getting more and more common. Guy comes in and he's shut down. Wired and tired. Would love to sleep, can't sleep. Hyperactive in his mind. Racing thoughts, monkey mind. He has food reactions that developed overnight. Boom. All of a sudden, gluten, dairy, eggs, can't process soy, doesn't know what to do with it, right? He gets gastrointestinal upset, joint pain, fatigue, brain shuts down, gone. No longer cognitive capacity of a normal human being. He's just like a vegetable. So he can no longer run his company. So he goes to a very well-known medical clinic, runs many, many panels, $20,000 plus down the drain. They come back and say, hey, I think you just have a mild elevated blood pressure and cholesterol and you should be fine. Right? So this guy's like, I'm not fine. This came out of nowhere and shut me down. Something's wrong. Your analysis can't be correct. Oh, no, it's all in your head. So I said, okay, when's the last time you felt great? He says, well, gosh, well, I was out of the house, and I took my kids, and we went camping, and we went to Yosemite. And after the first couple of days, all of a sudden, I started breathing more. I could feel more things coming alive, and my brain started coming back online. And by the end of my seven-day trip, I felt like a champ. And then I went back, and I lived my normal life, and whew, Drop back down again. So what do you think I asked this guy? I said, so when did you remodel your house? He says, wait, wait, what? I said, well, you didn't mention buying a new house, so you must have remodeled your house. He says, yeah. He's like, when did your symptoms start? Six months ago. When did you remodel your house? Six months ago. Oh, man. Seriously? Did you do new floors? Yeah. Oh, no. Gosh. Do you do new countertops? Uh, yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. And did you redo your paint? Yeah, I did. Was it prior to 1970? Was your paint prior? Was your house older? Is it an older house? Yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. So what do you got to do? Right? You can't move out of the house. So we had this guy bake his house, turn on his heat as high as he possibly could, have him come out of the house for a couple of days. Come back, open up the windows. Heat, kinetic energy, accelerates bond separation. So you had more off-gassing of the volatile compounds in his cabinetry, on his flooring, on his countertops. And then he installed a VOC air purifier. He changed his furnace filtration because toxins travel on dust. And by doing so, he reduced his exposure. He left his windows open as much as possible. He was living in California, so that was possible. And all of a sudden, his symptoms started getting better. We started focusing on some of the, the protocols we're going to talk about later on, and he's completely functional. He's back running his company. So when people come into you, and they have these extensive analyses, and you go, what's going on? It could be where they're at, their home, their office, their new car. So this is Bellingham Functional Medicine. That's my son, Ben, and I. We're installing these stranded bamboo floors on a cork underlayment. Behind us is a light-colored, low VOC paint on the wall. It took us a lot of time and energy. We had to consider every single little piece of caulking, everything that we would varnish or paint or do anything, some sort of coating, it would be linseed oil. It would not be some sort of toxic chemical compound because this changes your indoor air environment to be something you're exposed to 10,800 cubic feet per day all day long. It used to be at the turn of the century, we had massive amounts of air circulation going on. Now, 5% per hour of air exchange in the typical office place. Since then, we've had a lot of chemicals that have changed. The MDS press boarding, the formaldehyde coming from cabinets, the pesticides that are sprayed on floor, the flame retardants on the flooring, all these chemicals now have been equated to almost like being exposed to Gulf War Syndrome. This is the information from Dr. Claudia Miller. She's an environmental toxicologist. And she compares people who were in the Gulf War and had all that oil off-gassing and all the chemicals from warfare to pesticide exposed to remodeling exposed and found similar problems with fatigue, depression, headaches, shortness of breath, asthma, and wheezing. This is a real phenomenon. 
Did you know that the worldwide GDP, 7 to 9% of the GDP is from construction materials? Profit comes from people cutting edges. People finding things that are lower cost, whether or not they are as safe. So it's our responsibility, and there are websites now, pharaohsproject.net, that look at the potential damage that could happen to humans when exposed to chemicals used in building supplies. So we found that Eileen Story, director of University of Connecticut Center for Indoor Environments, 40 to 55 percent, 40 to 55 percent of office occupants complain of something called sick building syndrome. Sick building, that's half of the people in an office almost who at one time or another will experience fatigue or headaches or malaise because of the chemicals their body is trying to process in the indoor air. In Japan, they're actually emphasizing when a woman is pregnant, when a child is young, to put them in housing that has lower chemical exposure. There are safe places here in the United States where they actually do clean rooms. Have you heard of clean room treatment? People with autoimmune disease, autism, they'll actually take people and put them in clean rooms for a week, two days, two weeks. And over time, just by having a clean environment for them to breathe and exist and drink and eat, their symptoms will diminish. So potential sources, we know pesticides, fragrances, this is crazy. This is one of my pet peeves, right? <laughs> All right, I have multiple chemical sensitivities, so I'm really responsive to the fragrances, but I'm one of those people who loves to run outside and trail run, right? And occasionally I'll pass people when I'm running, you know, and they'll come the other way, and I can smell that aftershave, or I can smell that perfume, or I can smell that deodorant, right? Or the dryer sheets on their clothes. I'm that sensitive, right? And it's like I enter a cloud. It's like, I'm running, hey, you know, oh no, right? So I will actually go home and I can smell those chemicals on my clothing because they are petroleum-based byproducts and petroleum is sticky. Have you ever seen tar in the middle of a freeway? Have you ever ridden over that with your tires and then all the rocks get stuck on that? These chemicals based off petroleum are very, very sticky. And they will stick to you, your clothing. They will stick to oil in the clothing and the dyes. They'll stick to oil in your face and your hair. And you will have those products. And some of those will get through your skin and you'll end up with those in your body. So scented products, if you look at the literature, are contributing to endocrine disorders, including thyroid disease, including obesity, including diabetes. Why? Petroleum has ring-like structures. Ring-like structures that mimic what? What else has ring-like structures? Cecosteroid hormone vitamin D has a ring-like structure. Estrogen has a ring-like structure. Testosterone has the phenolic ring structures, the rings, the benzene rings. So these structures are now confusing the human body. The human body is exposed to a lot of these things, and we're thinking, ah, great, it's a hormone. But it's not. It's the wrong shape. And in the body, form equals everything. Communication happens via form. So our receptor sites try to interact with what it sees to be estrogen, and it's not its BPA, or it's a phthalate. And we have miscommunication, mismessages, and all of a sudden our cellular function goes down. We're getting exposed to these things immediately to our brain. When we inhale things, scented agents, they go right through the olfactory network to our brain. And they change our immune system of our brain, they change the immune system in our liver, in our kidneys, in our muscle, everywhere. And unfortunately, when it comes to air, you know, I had this chemistry professor in, uh, in high school, and he said, you know, if I breathe a piece of dust right now, it's possible in your lifetime that it could go to China and come back to you, and you could breathe that same piece of dust. I was like, what? That's crazy. But air doesn't stay in one place. Air travels. And there's a phenomenon that NASA has been actually tracking from India and China called the brown cloud. Have you heard of that? Where the actual pollution over there, when the winds whip up, throws their air pollution up into the jet stream, and within seven to ten days' time, it lands on the western seaboard of the United States. And when it lands on the western seaboard of the United States, we get an increase then of things that are in that air, including mercury. Turns out there's about 6,500 tons of mercury that was emitted into the air in 2010. That's 14,330,030 pounds in 2010. 
So the mercury concentrations in the upper 100 meters of the ocean have doubled in the past century, and we have 12 times more mercury than pre-industrial times. So what's in the ocean? Fish. What accumulates the mercury? Fish. 43 to 100% of the fish from nine countries exceeded safe consumption of one six-ounce fish meal per month. So what am I seeing? In clinical practice, what I'm seeing is a lot of CEOs, COOs, execs, who are coming in and they're saying, my memory's going south. I don't have a lot of good energy. I'm having neuropathy-like symptoms. You know, when I drink hot coffee, things get worse. When I go to a dental appointment, things get worse. And I say, aha, uh -huh. how much sushi are you eating? <laughs> Three, four times a week, of course. Uh huh. And you're getting the tuna. Yes, why wouldn't I? Well, according to experts, one serving of tuna a month may be too much. And you're getting three a week. Why would it be then, and there's really nice charts here that say eat three servings or less per month of high mercury food. No, it should be less than that now, according to the recent data. And avoid eating certain foods that are high predatory mackerel, swordfish, tilefish, shark, tuna, right? But there's another source that's really common, especially in older populations. When the hot coffee happens, when the teeth brushing happens, when the dental appointment with the polishing happens, and that is dental amalgams, silver fillings. How many of you ask your clients on the intake form, how many dental amalgams do you have? Yes, thank you. How many do physical examinations and look in the mouth? Thank you, Dr. Michael Stone. Right? Excellent. This is huge. Why? Because proven by autopsy studies, we found two to 12 times more mercury in body tissues of individuals with dental amalgam. What will exponentially increase the level of mercury in a human body when a person has just one surface area, let alone six or 14 surface areas of silver in their mouth? What will accelerate it tremendously? Having a gold crown in close proximity. Gold crown, noble metal, mercury, highly unstable. Mercury will be drawn to the gold and you'll increase the off-gassing from that tooth multiple fold. All right, action items. What are you going to be ask, asking people then? Watch your air. Where are you? What's going on? Do you live and work in a new house? Is there a new gym? Is there a new car? I had one client come in, and she was having tachycardia-type issues. She was having all sorts of erratic heart problems. And the, the, the heart docs were like, oh, my gosh, what's going on? I don't know what's going on. And I was like, of course, well, what changed for you? What changed? She had a new car. So I started tracking people who had heart abnormality issues and new cars, new houses, and new gym memberships. And I've seen interesting correlations. So pay attention to these things. Now this is a fascinating case. I had one family, and this family comes in to see me, and of course the mom and the multiple kids are having all sorts of fatigue issues, food sensitivity problems, right? And I'm like, gosh, what is going on? It's the entire household. We did dietary changes. We did everything. We looked and looked and looked and looked. Well, I'm doing a FaceTime with her one day, and she passes by a window. And I'm like, wait, 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 wait back up. Point out the window. What, what's going on out there? And she said, oh, well, that's a fracking well. And I said, ah, OK. Is that a containment pond? Yeah. I'm like, what? Millions of pounds of chemicals get pushed out into that shell all the time, and then you're inhaling that stuff in close proximity to your house. Like, we're not going to make too much progress. So what can you do for everybody? You can have people get their ducts clean at office, old office buildings, in old homes. That's always nice. They can install electrostatic pleated air filters. Now, this is called Walter Crinion's Trilogy. So this is one of our teachers of detox, who just recently passed this last year, who brought to light that air is behind everybody's health. And if you do these three things, you can reduce their exposure exponentially to harmful compounds and make progress. Purchase an air purifier that has both a HEPA filter and VOC gas filtration. So this reduces some of those volatile organic compounds coming from the paints and whatnot. Okay, so we're all exposed. Some of these chemicals resist metabolism and the quantity of an exogenous substance or its metabolites that accumulate is our body burden. 
So the average person walking around, when they do body burden studies, there's 167 different chemicals found, and not one of these people worked with chemicals. When you look at body burden studies and you say, look, everybody's just living their normal lives, we're going to track what kind of chemical levels, whether it's coming from adults, whether it's coming from medical workers, whether it's coming from infants, everybody's testing positive. Methylmercury, arsenic, phthalates, we get all sorts of different things. Specifically in the medical industry, a lot of plastics. The bisphenol A, a lot of the phthalates. In dental offices, of course, mercury is going to be increased. Perfluorinated compounds, polybrominated diethyl ethers, those are the, the flame retardants. Triclosan, of course, with the hand sanitizing. Thankfully, that's been banned, right, in a lot of different places. So a lot less exposure to that these days. All 20 participants in healthcare had five of these six, and 13 participants had all six chemicals. All of them had BPA, plastics, the PBDEs, and the perfluorinated compounds. So waterproofing type compounds, flame retardant type compounds, and plastics. Now, the problem with BPA is interesting. Pete Myers, I just spent some time with him this last year. He's one of the original founders of the BPA research in the United States, who uh, was part of the team that coined the term endocrine disrupting chemicals. And what he says is interesting. He says, you know, Tom, how many studies do you think it takes before somebody withdraws a potential chemical of harm from the marketplace? I said, well, I don't know. He says, early 1950s bills in our own United States files say that you only need one study to show potential harm in humans from one independent lab, and you need another study from some other area that had no connection and no knowledge of that other lab, and the two of them should justify us having a problem or a concern and withdraw that from marketplace until further studies happen. He says there's been over 800 solid studies of BPA, and it's still on the marketplace. So it's interesting, right? You, you begin to wonder, why is that? Well, it's a massive industry for this. Do you know back in the 1950s, BPA was originally discovered and used as an artificial estrogen? It was used in animal feed to fatten up animals. There are a couple of trials of it being used in females to change estrogen levels. And now it's being used across our globe at 372,000 tons of increase in 2012 alone. So that's... 745,840,000 pound increase in 2012. This was taken from an industry article, which is interesting. They're trying to tell people to invest in BPA because there's a ton of profit in it. So it's everywhere. We're finding over 200 chemicals in the umbilical cord of unborn children. We found it in all the healthcare workers. And we're seeing the effects happen at minute doses. These are microgram per kilogram body weight. You're seeing alteration in cell signaling at tremendously low doses. Why is that? What's the dose of a hormone? Do you dose hormones in grams, milligrams, micrograms? Oftentimes it's picograms. It's teeny, 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 teeny amounts. Why? Because you don't want to change the cellular function of every single cell in the human body to take on a bunch of tasks unless they're absolutely needed. Teeny, teeny, teeny amounts. And the problem is, is that studies are done on what's called the LD50, lethal dose 50. What is the toxic level that a cell can no longer function at? Instead of what's the dose that changes cellular function? So we're seeing changes in brain, fat cells, liver cells, muscle cells, heart cells that are now directly attributed to endocrine-disrupting chemical exposure. All right, time to partner up. We've got about, let's say, five minutes. Let's get together in pairs, and as much as you're comfortable, share on your timeline where you think you may be dealing with some sort of chemical influences or exposure, and then discuss where constant low-level exposures could be coming from. So this is on your timeline. Pull your timelines out, and then look at where it might be on the timeline that there could have been a remodel, that there could have been mercury amalgam changes, you changed a filling, that you had some sort of alternate chemical exposure change. Can be kind of startling, right? You look at your timeline, you say, wait a second, life goes on, I get exposed to stuff, you know, there are things that happen, and yeah, wow, it could be shifting my health. The more that you track a timeline, whether you're using a software aid or you're using the aids from the Institute for Functional Medicine, when it comes to the physical documents, the better off you're going to be. 
Please ask yourself why, 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 why. When something goes wrong with a human, it's usually not just because. It's some sort of contributor. And just so you know, there are no causes to disease. None. BRCA1, BRCA2 does not cause breast cancer. There's nothing that causes. There are multiple contributors. So we lose the forest from the trees when we're looking for one single cause all the time. It's always contributors. The more you ask why, 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 the more contributors you can change. There are 36 holes in the roof of Alzheimer's disease, according to Dr. Dale Bredesen. When you find all 36 of those holes and you repair them, you can reverse it. So don't look for one cause. It's usually multiple things. It's the same thing with toxicity. Toxicity in of, of itself, if you just get exposed to mercury, it might not be problematic. But you get exposed to mercury and lead, it can become lethal at smaller doses. There are these synergistic effects. If there are 87,000 toxins out there, they don't act one-on-one. -on -one. It's one plus one plus one plus one equals a thousand-fold effect. So look at all the different exposures. Try and find all the different things. The synergy of toxicity is real. The more you can reduce, the better off you are. The bigger buckets, the water purifier, the air purifier, the food clean and organic, will make a massive difference for people. So, chronic toxic exposure can amplify other pathological processes, can create or contribute to a wide variety of chronic diseases and lead to toxicant-induced loss of tolerance. What is that? Tilt. Basically, it's you get to a point where your body can't tolerate toxic exposure. You have multiple chemical sensitivities. So a person walks into a grocery store, they can't handle the scented laundry detergents. They can't handle the hardware store pesticides, right? There's a threshold. 